Good afternoon, students. Let's start our session today. Uh, we'll be doing module four of our introduction to networks, CCNA, introduction to networks. Module four is physical layer. As we go through uh, <clears throat> this unit, data comm and network management, you will see what we study in the lecture and what we study in the lab, they overlap. Except in the lecture, you will be concentrating on the theory aspect. And in the lab, you would actually uh, be building networks, doing the physical, uh, practical aspect, okay? By using the ind industry standard, which is our uh, Cisco CCNA. So this is the lab session, module four, physical layer, okay? Some of the things we are going to cover here today, I'm sure you'll be familiar with it. We'll be looking at uh, physical layer. What does it do? What are the layers? Okay. And what are the, uh, you already know that we have got the OSI model consisting of seven layers. The first layer being the physical layer. What are the characteristics of the physical layer? Uh, <clears throat> what is copper cabling? What is UTP cabling? What is fiber optic cabling? And what is wireless media? You will be getting more information about these, okay? You should rem remember as network engineers, you don't have to actually create copper cables or UTP cables or fiber optic cables or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, uh, establish uh, wireless configurations. You don't have to do that, but you should be perhaps aware that uh, what these technologies are and how they work. Okay, we have got technicians, network technicians, who will take care of the cabling for us. Okay, but we have to know how they work. So let's look at the purpose of the physical layer. Why do we have a physical layer? First things first. Before any network communication is established, we have to make sure that a physical connection is, <laughs> is established without a physical connection, how you want to network, okay? It can be wired or wireless, depending on what setup you may follow. And <clears throat> it depends uh, whether you are doing this at a, home or a home office or a enterprise office, institution, a corporation. Uh, so the network designs will be different, okay? Uh, and usually, no matter what kind of uh, device you're using, if you want to connect to a network, it is done through something called a NIC, a network interface card, okay? Now that's that NIC, a network interface card will connect your device to the network, okay? So here, for example, I have got an example of a, a network interface card, uh, which is going on a desktop's PCI slot. If you're using a notebook computer, you can see that you have got an Ethernet port, okay? That's called the RJ45 port. What about your smartphones? That also has got a network interface card, but it's a wireless network interface card, okay? So without that interface, you cannot connect. And on that interface is your MAC address, okay? The hexadecimal MAC address, which is hard-coded onto your NIC, okay? Most of our netbook, uh, sorry, most of our notebooks, if you see, uh, we have got a, a network interface card, which is uh, hardwired on the motherboard. Okay. 
In this case, in this example, what I have here is an actual uh, PCI slot network interface card. Uh, for those of us who are using desktop, okay, uh, you know, our special gaming PCs. Now, we have gone through this already last week. When you send data from the application layer down to the physical layer, first, the data is converted into segments, from segments into packets, from packets into frames, and from frames, it is transmitted into bits and signals, okay? At the other end, exactly the same thing happens. The frames get the data are built up from the bits and uh, signals that come from the sender. And then they are sent to the upper layer as packets, and then from that packet to segments. And the segments will have numbers associated with them. And the receiver will be numbering them according to order. And then from that, a proper user data will be generated. Okay. So it's all about communication, communication between one layer to another layer. Okay. So when you get a frame okay, from your data link layer, it has to be encoded. Okay. It has to be encoded into a series of signals. Now, when you're encoding it, okay, uh, depends what media you're using to transfer the signals. Now, we'll look at some of the characteristics of our physical layer. Looking at the OSI model, the seven-layered OSI model, the first layer being physical, uh, it has got certain standards that are implemented by our many organizations, which we studied yesterday. And these organizations are ISO, EIA, TIA, ITUT, ANSI, IEEE, okay? Each of them have got specific role to play in establishing, our, in, in establishing standards. And all the manufacturers out there, they have to adhere to these standards. They cannot do whatever they want. Uh, they have to follow exactly those standards. Okay. Looking at some of the physical layer standards, you have to look at three functional areas. Number one, physical components. Number two, encoding. And number three, signaling. Okay. Physical components are the hardware devices, your network interface card, your cables, uh, your connectors that transmit the signals and represent the bits. Okay. So all of these uh, are your physical components. What are encoding? Encoding converts your stream of bits into a way of transmitting data. If you remember your lecture two, we studied about different kinds of encoding. One of them was Manchester encoding, okay? I have uploaded the videos of lecture one and lecture two. So please go to Moodle and follow those videos so you can perhaps revise. So these encoding methods allow us to transfer these signals, these bits, and uh, into actual signals, pulses, that will go through the medium, and at the destination, it will be again uh, <clears throat> decoded. The signaling method is how the <laughs> bits, values one and zero are represented. For example, if you are sending it through a fiber optic cable, it will be light pulses. Uh, if you're sending uh, over copper cable, for example, uh, it will be uh, pulses of microwave signals, okay? Look at this over here. For digital signals, uh, they're showing you the microwave signals over your 
wireless for digital, how it looks, and for your uh, analog, AM, FM, PM, which are, our, which are usually our radio signals, okay? Uh, copper cables uh, can be uh, different kinds, can be uh, UTP, can be coaxial, and so on. Certain terms which we have studied before, we are going to study it again. The term bandwidth, bandwidth means the total capacity that a medium can carry, okay? Usually, we studied in the lecture that the bandwidth uh, <clears throat> that is given to us doesn't mean that you can send the exact number of the high, you know, match that bandwidth and send the exact bandwidth of data. You have to send lesser than that. Okay. So the amount of data that can that can flow inside is called the bandwidth. And we can measure the bandwidth by uh, bits by second, or uh, <clears throat> its units can be kilobits per second, megabits per second, um, and so on. Gigabits per second, terabits per second, exabits per second, and so on. Okay. Some other keywords that you have to remember uh, is latency, which is a delay taken for data to travel from one point to another point. Trough put is the actual data, okay, that is transferred through the media. So remember in the lecture we studied what's the difference between bandwidth and trough put? Bandwidth is the capacity. Trough put is the actual data that travels. So as long as your trough put is less than your bandwidth, you're okay. There's another term which is good put which is a measure of usable data transferred over a given period of time. So how can you get a value for that? Trough put minus traffic overhead will give you the good put. Now let's go into the physical medium, okay? Uh, which is our uh, copper cabling. There is a question from Suhas which says, where can we find this document? This document is inside your NetACAD. When you go to NetACAD, when you log in, and when you are reading the chapters one by one, all this information is inside there, okay? So this is chapter four information. So- is there one question? Yes. Uh, regarding good put, uh, you said it's throughput minus traffic overhead. Is this traffic overhead similar to resistance in wires that you would assume? That is one of the factors. Overhead can be uh, many other factors. It can be interference. It can be noise. It can be so many other factors. So all the factors, you join it together. So that would be the overhead. I see. So the third, uh, the good put would essentially be the meaningful data that's being transferred, yes? Yes, you can say that, correct. Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks. So my dear students, you are encouraged to ask questions, okay? Because we are doing uh, a lab session. So uh, in the lab, uh, of course, this one is just presenting you the ideas, but you can uh, answer questions, okay? In tomorrow's lab, is, is where uh, I don't do anything, you uh, do all the work and you show me your work. But when I'm presenting to you, uh, you can also ask questions. Continuing with copper cabling, let's have a look at some of the uh, copper cables that we have, okay? It is the most common cables and one of the most common cables I've been repeating this over and over again is your UTP, UTP, UTP. That is the standard since the early 80s we have been using, okay? It is inexpensive, easy to install and has low resistance to electrical current flow, okay? Uh, but the lim limitations is attenuation. You already know what's attenuation. Attenuation means when your signal becomes weak, and attenuation always happens when 
your signal is traveling through a medium of a certain length, it has to be, the signal has to be regenerated, okay? That's why when you use a certain cable, you have to follow the IEEE RFC, request for comments. You have to see, for example, this cable, what should be the length? So the technician will come to you and say, uh, sir, uh, this uh, UTP cable from uh, PC to uh, uh, switch, the wire has to go through the roof and go to the uh, switch room. So what should be the length? And then you tell your technician, it should not be more than 100 meters, okay? Or if you want to, as a network engineer, you want to make sure that your enterprise network is the best, you, you have a standard. You make sure it doesn't go beyond 70 meters, okay? So all these tests have been done earlier, okay, by IEEE, and they have, you know, they've put all the requirements in the RFCs. So you can refer to those. Another thing you should remember that your electrical signal can be changed, okay, to electromagnetic interference and also radio frequency interference. Yes, these are called uh, noise that can affect your <laughs> cables. So this is one of the problems we have with our copper cables. That is why migrating to uh, fiber optic solves a lot of these problems that uh, electrical, uh, sorry, uh, copper cables uh, generate, okay? They can create electromagnetic interference and RFI. Um, and also, you know, sometimes you can have crosstalk. Example of a crosstalk is, I don't know, uh, if you have experienced this in the old analog uh, telephone systems that we had, uh, sometimes what happens is two, two channels will overlap each other. So while you're talking to the other person in the background, you can also hear two other people talking. Have you ever experienced something like this? Okay, so that is a cross talk. Okay, so this can happen even in digital communications. That's why they say electrical signals are always susceptible to EMI and RFI. How do we solve EMI and RFI problem? Very simple. Follow uh, cable length limits. When we say UTP 100 meters, do not make it 101. Okay. <laughs> um, talk to your uh, uh, manager or talk to your contractor and say, hey, I have a degree. I know what I'm talking about. Can you please not do your own thing? Okay. If you do their own thing, you can just resign and go somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> you have to make sure. Sir, okay. can you please uh, tell me the reason why I cannot make it to one-on-one? -on -one? I didn't uh, understand your question. Repeat, please. Uh, why can we not make it to 101 if we need uh, like 100? Because after 100, the signal will attenuate from 0 to 100 meters, the signal will be very good. Exactly after 100 meters, the signal will be useless. Now, this research has been already carried out. The moment you go beyond that, uh, no, your signal, there is no guarantee. Now, what you may do, you may make it 101, and it may still work, but not always, okay? So if you follow the guidelines that is given to us in the RFCs, it is UTP cables, 100 meters. The moment you go beyond that, we'll have problem. Again, uh, you know, there are certain things uh, you have to follow, like uh, what kind of switch you are using as well, okay? Is it a 2960 switch? So <clears throat> these information, all you have to follow in your uh, RFCs, okay? 
So adherence to these standards will ensure that your network is perfect. Okay. That's why when you're going to a new uh, institution as a network uh, engineer, once you have got your, let's say, CCNA, and uh, you encounter network problems, then you have to perhaps go and again measure the cabling and make sure that everything has been uh, designed perfectly. And it is, you know, the, the contractors who come and establish a cable in a company or an enterprise, they follow those standards, okay? And those standards are enforced by people like you, network engineers who will ensure, otherwise, you know, the network will generate problems. Okay. Next, we should have um, uh, <clears throat> some kind of cable uh, mitigating uh, shields, okay? For example, UTP has got a plastic cover uh, that ensures that uh, to some extent, not completely, ensures that, you know, it doesn't get affected by EMI and radio frequency. Uh, you can do this test, get a powerful magnet and put it in beside your UTP cable and then try and ping and see what happens. Okay, <laughs> you can do these kind of tests. Uh, some uh, copper cables, you know, they uh, generate crosstalk. So what we do is we twist them together. When you twist them together, so that cancels the noise. Uh, for those of you who have uh, experienced certain cables, uh, I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about your coaxial cable. If you have got coaxial cable where you get your, you know, uh, TV channels, your cable TV, sometimes you will see uh, one channel is overlapping another channel. Why does this happen? Because uh, your cable provider has not followed the rules. Your cable provider, perhaps instead of going uh, <laughs> 10 meters from the source, has gone 15 meters. Okay, so talk to your cable provider and tell your cable provider to fix it. Okay, because they are trying to save costs. Okay. So, one way to cancel uh, noise or cancel uh, interference is by twisting the cables together. So, the interference by the two cables transfer each other out. That is why we have got UTP, unshielded twisted pair. Okay. That's the idea behind it. Now, these are some of the cables that we use in data transfer. We have got your UTP cable, we have got your STP cable, and we have got your coaxial cable. Now, a type of coaxial cable is the one we use for our even uh, cable television. This is the common cable that we use in the lab, usually CAT5 or CAT6. Uh, and this is our shielded twisted pair, STP. Uh, slightly more expensive than our UTP cable. You can see the connection inside has got an extra shield, okay? Otherwise, it's exactly the same as UTP cable. Even after this came out, my dear students, STP cable, still the industry was fixed on this, okay? Rather than shifting to this because it was expensive, no, they are still fixed on this, even to this day, my dear students, okay? Sometimes you may come out with a new technology, but the industry does not accept it, okay? Let's look at the UTP cable. Uh, it is the most common networking media and <clears throat> It is connected to a RJ45 connector. This is your RJ45 connector, okay? So what you have to do is you have to arrange these wires in a certain alignment, okay? These wires are orange, white, orange, green, green, uh, white, green, blue, uh, white, blue, and brown, white, brown. 
So you arrange these wires in certain orientation, and then you push it inside this RJ45, and then use a cramping tool and press it hard. Okay? Once you do that, that's it. Network wire has been cramped, and then you cannot separate them anymore. Okay? So, <clears throat> If you go and buy a cable from these uh, computer shops, they'll be doing a cramping for you. Now, how they arrange the wire makes a difference between our uh, straight through cable and our crossover cable, which we'll be looking at uh, later. Okay, so. If you look at your UTP cable, the only thing that you have is a plastic cover. It covers uh, the inner wires, the twisted pair wires from damage and from interference. Okay. Why do we twist them together like this? To make sure that the, uh, the noise that they generate, okay, noise means interference, uh, cancel each other out. Okay. And each color has got a specific uh, code. So what we do is, uh, once we look at these colors, we can arrange it in a particular order. If we don't have color, then how do you arrange it in a particular order and create your straight through and your uh, crossover cables? One of the lab exercise used to be creating a cable, okay, where the students have to actually create a UTP cable. And in that lab session, a lot of these RJ45 uh, connectors get wasted because our students have to practice and practice and practice. But with the new Cisco standard, we don't do that anymore, okay? Uh, Network engineers don't have to, they have to know how it works. Our technicians will create the cables for us, okay? We also have the STP cable, okay? Now, if you look at this, uh, it is a grade better than your UTP. Of course, you have the protective sheet just like your UTP, but you also have a braided foil, you see? that provides protection from EMI and RFI. Otherwise, everything else is the same. So when you have something like this, you will have a better noise protection. Of course, it's a little bit more expensive, okay? And it's harder to install than UTP, but it still works with RJ45 connectors, okay? But when you compare them together, when this was introduced, uh, you know, Everybody thought, okay, we are going to move from this to this. But the industry said, no, we uh, still want our sir, UTP. Yes? You said that uh, it's difficult to install. So what do you mean by like, by looking at this, uh, it's going to be same? No, because of this, you see this protective sheet, it would be difficult to bend it. And that can damage it. Or even stepping on it can damage it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this kind of things um, and the expense itself, you know, uh, even the difference in meters, because when you buy cables like this, they will ask you how many meters you want. Uh, and usually when you go and buy cables, uh, when a company invests in cabling, they don't buy meters. They, they buy uh, perhaps uh, hundreds of meters. Okay. So... <laughs> because they want to, the contractor wants to cable the whole uh, institution, right? So when you have a price comparison, even little bit uh, difference, this one would come up to a huge uh, amount compared to the UTP cable. So a contractor is trying to save money, correct? So what he will do is, uh, and, and you know, when it comes to the work and data flow, this is as good as your STP. So this is something that, you know, so many times if you study uh, the industry, you will see that many inventions have come out 
which are very good than the existing invention, but uh, <laughs> uh, the industry sticks to what they are using. They don't want to change. Okay, so this is an example of that. Till today, we use our UTP cable. Um, another example of that would be your, uh, you know, in the 80s when we had the uh, uh, revolution of video all around the world, uh, where we could get uh, video cassettes and played on our uh, video uh, players. You know, we used to go and rent movies and all that before we had Netflix and downloading. We used to go to a shop and, you know, rent a cassette or a movie and so on. So the better technology was something called Betamax, okay? But industry chose VHS instead, which was bigger, bulkier, okay? So there are certain reasons why, you know, uh, industry chooses a certain thing. Usually, usually cost is a very important factor, okay? Now let's go to a coaxial cable. If you look at your coaxial cable, you can see, of course, much, much better protection, okay? You have got an outer cable jacket to prevent minor physical damage, and you also have a woven copper braid uh, to cancel the noise and to make sure that uh, the circuit is uh, properly shielded, you also have another plastic insulation. Can you see that? Uh, this to make sure that there is no, uh, you know, disturbance. Uh, there's no noise affecting the actual signal, which goes through this thick copper core. Okay. An example of this would be those of you who are using uh, cable TV at home. Those of you who are using Astro. Look at that, that cable that you're using. It's one kind of coaxial cable. Okay, And it has got different kinds of connectors. Now, the problem with this technology is attenuation is very fast. So you have to regenerate the signal at certain uh, point, and that is expensive. And this cable is not exactly cheap as UTP cable. It's expensive. And these connectors, my dear students, are also expensive. Okay. So that's why this is also a coaxial cable is a dying, uh, sort of a dying technology. Okay, with the advent of fiber optic, um, fiber optic is replacing everything except this. Our UTP still surviving, my dear students. Okay. Now look at the UTP cabling. How do you establish a cable in your, uh, by using UTP? So there are four pairs, color-coded pairs, okay, consisting of copper cables. Okay? There is uh, <laughs> there is only one outer shield. Besides that, there is no shield. And you you should see you 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 go and see in 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 the enterprises how it is used. People may step on it. People people may sit on it, and it still works. And if there is a disconnection, just cut the wire and cramp a new one. Take RJ45, cramp a new one. Okay? Very easy to replace. Uh, once again, the reason they are twisted, what they do is, each wire in a pair of wires uses opposite polarity. One wire is negative and the other wire is positive. And this twisting, okay, cancels the EMI and RFI uh, interference from outside. And also, if there is an interference generated by themselves, they cancel each other out. Okay. So let's look at different kinds of our UTP cables. We have got CAT3 and we have got CAT5 and CAT6. Needless to say that CAT6 is uh, the best UTP cable. You can see it has got a, a, a plastic uh, sheet. You know, it's not exactly a sheet, a plastic line that separates the pairs from each other, okay? There's no such thing in CAT3 and CAT5, okay? If you don't see this plastic line that separates them, 
That means you are either working with category five or lower grade. Okay. But many of the many industries, many people are happy with your cat five because uh, <clears throat> the data transmission is still the same. Okay. So the standard for UTP is established by TIA and EIA. Uh, <clears throat> these are giving standards like what kind of cable you have to use, what is the length of that cable, what kind of connectors you have to use, when you have to terminate the cable, what are the testing methods, okay? Uh, testing methods to make sure that this cable is connected, uh, this cable can transmit data. You have got actual uh, uh, cable testing methods. What you do is you connect one end of the UTP cable to that testing device and the other end to another section of the testing device, you press a button, and if you have got all the eight lights uh, uh, flickering, that means the cable is perfect. You can start using it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, standards are established by IEEE. You see, like someone asked me. Uh, uh, why we cannot go beyond 100? You can, but then you, uh, IEEE does not guarantee that you your signal will be transmitted. Okay, so since you know that the tests have been carried out, it cannot go from the device from the computer connection to the switch beyond 100 meters. So make sure that it's always lesser than 100 meters. Okay because you have to make sure your company's network is good and there is no other problem, okay? This is the RJ45 connector, my dear students. Uh, this is where the cable will go in. Now, this is a good example of cramping, you see? Properly terminated UTP cable. Now, this is a bad example, okay? This is what normally uh, somebody who is inexperienced will do, okay? Somebody who hasn't cramped before. But even when you do this, okay, try stepping on it. Try, you know, uh, doing uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, uh, the only way to destroy it, I, I think, is to take a scissor and cut it, okay? Because if you step on it, uh, it still works, okay? If you actually want to damage it, you can take a hammer and keep on hitting it until it stops working. Okay, there's a reason that the industry is stuck to these, okay, and loves using our UTP cable. And this is the socket that which is uh, on our computers, on our switch, on our routers, okay? So this is the RJ45 socket. Every computer that comes in these days has got, you may not have an optical uh, drive, but definitely you have a RJ45 socket. Okay, it's an industry standard. Now, how do you create your UTP cable? Okay, when you do, when you do this, when you do a cramping of your UTP cable, you have to arrange it in a certain way. Now, that certain way is either T fifty six eight A arrangement or T fifty six eight B arrangement. Now you may say, "What am I talking about?" I'll tell you. T fifty six eight A means from pin one. Okay, look from pin one. If you arrange from pin one, okay, from pin one of your RJ forty five, the first would be white green. green, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. So you cramp it like this, okay? Once you cramp it like this, uh, <clears throat> both ends, if they are T568A, what you have is straight through, okay? 
Another way you can create a straight through cable is if both ends have got T56 8B. Okay, in T56 8B, so first you'll have, uh, you see the arrangement has changed. White, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. So if both ends are the same, then you have got, again, straight through cable. So what is crossover? Crossover means one end will be this and the other end will be this. Repeating, one end will be T568A, the other end will be T568B. Okay. The reason we are concentrating on UTP is because it is the industry standard. Okay, and no matter which enterprise you go, no matter which country you go, this is used for data communication in a Ethernet local area network. Okay, so remember, if you have to create a straight through cable, both ends should be T568A or both ends should be T568B. If you want to create a crossover cable, one end should be T568A, one end should be T568B. Now, my dear students, you don't have to memorize the color combination. Okay, that's not your job. If you want to check that the network technician is doing it properly, you can just refer online or you can refer to your CCNA. Rather than memorizing things like this, you might as well memorize something useful like the inter uh, internetwork uh, operating system commands. Okay, memorize that. That would be helpful. This one is just for your reference. How do I create a straight through cable? How do I create a crossover cable? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> We also have another uh, standard, which is belonging only to Cisco, which is a rollover cable. Rollover cable, remember uh, when, we, when we studied our first lab, uh, we said that uh, we need to connect our uh, network device, like a router or a switch, uh, uh, to a monitor by using a cross, uh, uh, sorry, by using a console cable, that blue cable, right? In Packet Tracer, we don't need to do that because Packet Tracer uh, is a simulation and it can show us everything. So you don't need to create a, a console cable. Although inside Packet Tracer, you still have a console cable which you can use. So the problem is your console cable, uh, uh, the COM port for your console cable is not available on all computers. Look at your computer that you're using. I guarantee you, if you're using a notebook, most of you don't have a, con uh, a COM port because it's an old technology. If you go to our BTEC lab, all the PCs have got a COM port. Not that they are old, they are very much new, but they also have a COM port because we have asked our supplier to give us a PC with a COM port. Why? because we want to connect our switches and our routers straight to the PC. But if you don't have a COM port, no problem. You can still use a, uh, an adapter that will convert, that adapter will connect uh, your console cable to a USB adapter, okay? So that is something that Cisco has invented. It's only belonging to Cisco. So we have all of these in the lab as well. Uh, but when we do these tests in Packet Tracer, uh, there's no issue because in Packet Tracer, there's no need for a console cable. Uh, when you have a switch on your Packet Tracer or when you have a router on your Packet Tracer, you can see the interaction and the commands. So no issue. Now, let's go to a fiber optic cable, which is quickly becoming an 
industry standard. Most of us, most of us using Unify, if you just look at the connection, if you can, if you're in a room where you have your Unify cabling, you will see that the cable that comes and connects to you is, is a Unify single mode cable. Okay. It's not common as UTP because expensive. Now we keep on saying expensive. We've been saying that fiber optic cables are expensive, expensive, expensive. And the price keeps falling down year by year. Okay. It is ideal for some networking scenarios, transmits large amount of data over large distances. When you compare it to uh, copper cables. And another thing, immune to EMI and RFI, okay? Just imagine something that is immune to EMI and RFI. Uh, <clears throat> made of flexible, extremely thin strands of pure glass. Uses a laser or lab to encode bits as pulses of light. That's how it transmits data, okay? Uh, and the signal loss is uh, very minimal, in, but it's not, uh, you know, uh, completely uh, damage proof. You know, you, if you bend it, uh, you can try if you have a unify, just take that wire and bend it. And then you see whether you still up, mem uh, you can follow this lecture. <laughs> so, so if you bend it um, completely, you know, if you, you may damage your cable, okay? Then you have to call your uh, contractor, Unify, and ask them to come and replace it, okay? Don't do it, I'm just, I'm just, uh, you can go to YouTube and you know you can see videos of how they, how they can damage it. So this is what a single mode fiber uh, looks and a multi-mode fiber looks, as far as your fiber optic cable is concerned. Uh, when you have a single, the one most of us that use uh, at home with respect to Unify is a single mode fiber, okay? Uh, so the core is usually nine microns, the glass core. In multi-mode, it is uh, ranging from 50 to 62.5 microns, okay? Which is, you know, uh, much more higher. <laughs> um, just imagine it can carry a, a, a data half a kilometer uh, without attenuation. Now that is something, okay? Uh, half a kilometer without attenuation, without regeneration. Uh, if the and the cost keeps uh, coming down, you see. So uh, that is why the whole world is shifting to this technology, okay? Fiber optic cabling is now being used in four types of industry. One is enterprise networks. It is fiber to the home, which is what most of us have. Uh, it is for connecting, uh, you know, uh, different institutions, governments, private networks, banks. Okay, that's why that fiber optic backbone is keeping on being established all around the world, okay? And submarine cable networks for providing reliable, high-speed, high-capacity solutions, capable of surviving in harsh undersea environments, uh, you know, that are at uh, huge distances from each other, okay? Some of these cables are given to you over here. For those of you who are using Unify, you will be familiar with this connection. Okay. You will be familiar with something, this connection, a single mode connector. Okay. So these are some examples. And some more connections, uh, fiber optic cables uh, that they are showing you over here. Um, usually a yellow jacket is a single mode fiber cable and orange for multi-mode. Okay. Uh, yeah. Again, that depends. Uh, it, as they say, it's usually uh, 
but not always. Uh, sometimes it may be white, a single mode may be white in color. If you compare your uh, copper cables in terms of UTP and fiber optic, just look at the bandwidth comparison, okay? Look at the distance. <laughs> look at uh, EMI and RFI. Uh, look at uh, other electrical hazards, okay? Uh, if, if you have got a lightning strike, uh, on an enterprise and all the computers are connected <laughs> by using UTP. God forbid, if that lightning get, gets into the system, all the computers will be fried. But there is no such thing with, with your <laughs> fiber optic cable. Even if there is a heavy lightning, <laughs> no problem. Okay. Uh, yes, you need a certain skill to handle fiber optic cable. Again, technicians are trained. Technicians are trained. Uh, there are special schools that you go to and they train you. You do uh, a certain amount of uh, training. And then, you know, uh, the telecom technicians who come to your house, okay? Not necessarily that even, uh, you know, they have finished, they, have, they are graduates, but they have that skill which they have, you know, uh, practice and, you know, makes them proficient in their job. Now, in today's age, we have to talk about our uh, wireless media as well, okay? Wireless networks. Um, it carries electromagnetic signals representing binary digits by using radio or microwave frequencies. Yes, you have mobility, okay? But the problem is it can be affected by uh, a lot of noise. So the limitation is the coverage area um, and, you know, physical devices can affect its deployment. Interference, uh, see, wireless is uh, susceptible to interference and can be disrupted by many common devices. Uh, Security-wise, uh, coverage requires no access to a physical strand of media, so anyone can gain access to the transmission. Uh, of course, we have got uh, uh, authorization uh, given by making accounts, but that can easily be cracked, okay? Uh, we can also uh, use a shared medium, okay, where we have got uh, an enterprise which uses all the kinds of connection. I mean, look at our university, even we have got that share medium working for us. Uh, usually wireless lines, they work in half duplex mode. Okay, that means only one device can uh, send or receive at a time. That is why when you're using wireless, you cannot expect your bandwidth to be the same as <laughs> UTP or for that matter, fiber optic, okay? Uh, but uh, we're still working on technologies that can uh, fix that, okay? One uh, technology that's coming to play and you know we keep hearing about it over and over again is our 5G technology. So with respect to uh, wireless, uh, uh, it covers, as, as per IEEE, it covers both uh, the data link and physical layers, okay? Uh, so how data is transferred into radio signals? Uh, what is the frequency and power of transmission? Uh, signal reception and decoding requirements, what are they? How the antenna should be designed, okay? All of these are established by IEEE. And some of these standards are IEEE 802.11 for Wi-Fi, for Bluetooth, IEEE 802.15. Uh, can you imagine living without Bluetooth in this day and age? Uh, YMAX is IEEE 802.16, and Zigbee is IEEE 
802.15.4. Now, all of these, my dear students, are the, the RFCs are online. You can go and have a look and see what are the uh, requirements, okay? Uh, the basic requirements. So as a network engineer, perhaps you will be referring to these and establishing your network. But you should also realize in an institution, our network in this day and age is a combination of fiber optic, UTP, and also wireless. Together, an enterprise will have these three merging together so that we have a viable network. When you go to campus, you know, in a uh, pre-pandemic days. Could you imagine uh, uh, an, a campus without Wi-Fi? Obviously not. Okay. So how they make that Wi-Fi possible? So if they have uh, a signal generator, it has to be connected to the network with one form of switch or another, correct? That's what we're going to study now. A wireless LAN requires the following devices, okay? A wireless access point. So that access point should be somewhere near your wireless device. Your wireless device, let's say your smartphone, should have a wireless NIC adapter. Otherwise, you won't be able to connect to the wireless. And you should be at a viable distance from your access point. Otherwise, the moment you leave that access point, the connection is broken, okay? That is why when a campus is established with wireless network, if the campus is big, it will have more expenses because it has to establish WAPs all around the campus, okay? If you go to our engineering building, every floor we have got a wireless access point. Why? Otherwise, uh, you know, you cannot access it, okay, because it has got certain range. Okay. So there are a number of uh, WLAN standards. So when purchasing these equipments, you have to ensure that they are compatible and interoperable uh, with uh, what your company requires, okay? So there are certain uh, companies making this, for example, Cisco uh, manufactures this, Huawei manufactures this. You have been hearing a lot about Huawei and uh, you know the Americans uh, having a, a souring relationship with Huawei, okay? One of the reasons is because they are manufacture devices uh, which are networking uh, devices, routers, switches, and you know, these wireless adapters. Okay, so Cisco has got a very uh, a good competition uh, as far as Huawei is concerned. Okay. Uh, so network administrators must develop and apply stringent security policies to make sure that their network is uh, safe, the WLAN is safe. Otherwise, you know, people can abuse it. So this brings us to the end of the session. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't look at any of your chat questions. If you have any questions now, you can ask me, my dear students, from today's session. Any questions that comes to your mind? None so far. Okay. Uh, again, uh, if you have time, uh, please go through the lecture one and lecture two, which I have already put on Moodle. The lab sessions also I'll be doing uh, very soon. Uh, sir, uh, just uh, one what? question. Yes. Regarding, uh, have we covered network security yet in our lectures? Mm, network security. Uh, as in, and did we cover anything relating to firewalls or anything? Uh, we will be more concentrating on firewalls in CCNA2 and CCNA3. Okay. okay. Yes. CCNA1 is an introduction, okay? 
uh, al although in packet tracer you can still uh, uh, you know experiment and use firewalls uh, but I, I suggest to you not to do that yet wait for your CCNA 2 and 3 where you know under lab conditions and under proper guidance you can do pack packet tracer experiments for yeah. now at this time what you do is concentrate on your basics okay and those basics are do you know how to give an ip address to your switch do you know how to give an ip address to your router you know those command line interface uh, you know inter networking operating system mm -hmm. ios operating system commands learn those practice 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 so it is a second nature you'll never forget okay all right you if you put okay. in front of a switch or a router um mm -hmm. I will just keep on uh, typing the commands in my mind because I've been doing this over and over again because I'm teaching it. In your case, you won't have, you have to refer to something, correct? Yeah, so you have to get familiar to it first. Yes, so in order not to refer to something uh, so that it's your second nature, remember these commands, you have to practice, 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 okay? All right, all right, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, another thing, uh, Practice doesn't mean a lab. The lab is a place where you prove to me that you can do it, okay? Okay. That is why before you come to the lab, you have to have made sure that you have practiced the previous lab exercises, the one which we did last week. Have you done it on your own? Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to practice that, you know, uh, giving an IP address to my uh, VLAN and making sure that it connects to uh, PCA and then another switch on VLAN uh, uh, on switch two, make sure that it connects to my PCB and then they can communicate with each other. Okay, those basic commands, make sure All you right. practice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of going through uh, uh, topic five as well, but then uh, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't want to overwhelm you, okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So That's tomorrow, a good idea. Yes, yes. So tomorrow, perhaps, we'll do topic five, or we'll do our lab session. Um, we'll see, okay?